And we're now moving on to Dave Collins, who is from the Institute of Coaching and Performance at the University of Central Lancashire. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I had the, the real pleasure of, li of listening to that uh, that presentation, the, the questions, which which really sort of suggest that I should probably situate myself. I um, I'm clearly not a very good dancer. I'm afraid I am the only way is ethics uh, Essex, sorry, um, <laughs> Saturday night fervor. So. Uh, I know some of you have had the misfortune to hear me before, so I'll apologize to you. And for the rest of you, what I do basically is I work as a performance psychologist. So I have a clinical counseling uh, qualification. I do counseling separately. I deal with people who are uh, actually experiencing problems. But the thrust that I come at from this is that if you want to perform better, and performance doesn't mean high level elite performance. So uh, I wish to be a better dancer so I can just embarrass my daughters at the weddings. Um, so I will try and as hard as I can to apply my performance psychology to improve my own performance. So it's not necessarily an elite thing, but it's a positive thing. And that's not to say it's positive psychology. Uh, so what I want to try and do is to unpack that for you today in the short period of time I've got. Um, I also want to just sort of contextualize what I'm saying by, by, by uh, reporting my experience when I saw the timetable today. The timetable is immensely complex. It's got high level speakers speaking on a wide range of subjects. It's actually more akin to a scientific conference. So if you're used to scientific conferences, um, this is going to be a fantastic experience. If you're not used to scientific uh, conferences and you're here as a practitioner saying, now how can I slot these things together? Yeah, it might be a little bit daunting uh, or you might actually fall into the, the, the trap that lots of practitioners do and say, I liked that one and that one, two from column A, one from column B, and then go and try it out on your students for the next two weeks who look at you with pain in their eyes and go, you've been on a course again, haven't you? <laughs> so, so what I want to try and do is to, is to uh, reflecting my background experience as a prop forward, it's going to be very, very simple, very, very quick. I understand from, from, from Marion and Helen that the slides will be either available or you know, uh, on, on sale from a, a stockish near you. So if you're sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. And if not, we'll wake you in half an hour with a cup of tea. Um, the, the big thing when you start getting into performance is there's lots and lots of models. Everybody loves models, yeah? They all want to get their, their name in the various journals, uh, Viz, Bino, whatever it is they're publishing in, and they want to push that out. And that's that's where people, you know, part of my, my game, one of my many hats is as an academic, and that's the way you play it. The trouble is that when I publish stuff in, in academe, I'm interested in me, mostly, and my research to a greater extent lots of the time than I am in the people I'm researching on. It doesn't mean you can't do two things at once, and it doesn't mean that you can't get excellent research models which are situated and focused on, di on supporting the performer. However, just be aware. So when you read all this good stuff and you go, I'll have two from column A and one from column B, some of that might be actually research through dance rather than research of dance or what you really want, which is research for dance. This is one such model, okay? This is the long-term athlete development model, um, which I, um, I'm afraid uni uniformly loathe because it was stuffed down everybody's throats for a number of years by the sporting gov governing bodies without actually ever checking lots of the things that, that, that form part of this. So it's a very tidy model. It looks very pretty, and you can, you can make a nice slide out of it, but there are all sorts of underpinning things in there that you don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily examined in enough detail. So it's very neat and tidy. If people were neat and tidy, yeah, we wouldn't need psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists. We're not. We're complex. We're, we've got we've all sorts of challenges going on. And even if we're comparatively sane, Lord knows what that is. Yeah, but even if we are, we're not. We're complex systems, and therefore a neat and tidy conceptualization. What looks nice in a sports council not trying to be rude, Dance UK, whatever, any sort of presentation that says, here's our model, it has to have sufficient flexibility to be able to deal with all the individuals and all the individual situations that you go with. So it was a pleasure to hear these ladies speak because they're clearly very, very much individually focused, even though they work within structures and organisations. Now, when you get lots of these models, they're theoretically weak and empirically questionable. Yeah? Um, in other words, they're, they're pretty dross. 
Uh, Einstein said, make everything as simple as you possibly can, but no more. And so I see my job as making the com complex things simple so that they're accessible and usable. But I won't get caught into making it too simple. Neither will I fall into the other scientist trap. And God knows there's a lot of it about, I'm sure not in dance, but I'll tell you what, in performance science in sport, it's oodles of making the simple thing complicated. Yeah? And that's how people make their living. And it's unethical and very annoying. So when you look at a model like this, and you're interested in developing people, and you go, windows of opportunity, there are certain times where you must do certain work, or you'll never achieve. Nonsense. Or critical periods. There are times when you've got to do this sort of training, and if you don't do that training, then, then this won't happen, then this won't happen, then this won't happen. Ah, yeah? Nonsense. 10,000 hours. The most misunderstood and misquoted idea in talent development. Yeah? To the extent that, for example, there's a noted Premiership football club that requires 10,000 touches a week. So they give the kids a ball and say, go home and touch that ball 10,000 times. You know, being a rugby player, I'm going, oh, 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 you know, it's not going to work very well. But the idea is get out there and practice. And again, it's, it's fundamentally correct, but there's all sorts of nuances on it. There's all sorts of shades of grey, hopefully not 50 of them, but there's certainly lots of shades of grey in there. Um, you can see who laughed. You can we know who you did anyway but what so what i'm saying is that these models tend to be over comp they tend to be over tidy yeah or they tend to be people advertising their wares so please be cautious what we're after doing is separating the real deal from the pretenders so you get a thing called science in this science in this is named after an american comedian who talked about truth in this something that really appears true and you know it's complete uh, tosh um, and we've come up with science, science in this because so much in my, my discipline in sports science is science -y. You take an idea, it's really simple, it's really complicated, or it's wrong, and you put lots of statistics and long words around it, like obfuscate, which is a great Scrabble score. I'm not sure what it means, but it's really good. I want to use it again, obfuscate, obfuscate. Anyway, you use all these different words and you stick them in there. And unfortunately, uh, what you end up with is science in this. Something that looks sciencey, glitters, but certainly ain't gold. This is one. Of, this is a key quote for me. Hopefully, man here is gender free. But the point here is that if you, if if what you do, and this is again a practitioner's solution, I can understand it. If you go and listen to a shoulder surge surgeon, a, an eating disorder specialist, a performance psychologist, or whatever and listen for little snippets of method, yeah, rather like a magpie, then what you end up with is something that's very, very difficult to integrate. So I would much rather, I, I would prefer coaches to be filing cabinets, not magpies. And at whatever level, level one through level 27, grand wazir, doesn't matter, I would prefer that they had a good understanding of the interrelationship between the different ideas as to how they fit together. Accordingly, a very, very, very simple, can't get much more simpler than that, talent development pie. Talent development is going to depend on a series of interactions and actions between the performer, the coach, and the environment. Um, one of your speakers earlier mentioned biopsychosocial, which again, I would, I would completely commit to. And the mistake comes if you do too much in one of those boxes. So if all of a sudden, uh, and this is very common in sport, it becomes the cult of the coach. And the coach must control everything and do everything. And that's never a good idea, however good the coach is. Because, you know, I worked as a sports psychologist when, in a sport and I then became its performance director. I can't carry on being the, coach, the, the, the psychologist. I can't do it. Because my role, the role, you know, the role clashes are just too great. So it's very, very often useful for me to say, okay, I know I could do this, but if I can delegate it to you, now all of a sudden we've got a, a little bit of symbiosis here and things are going on. And similarly, that the environment. So rather than look at this next session as this is, a, this is a session on mental skills, which are mental skills are very good, don't get me wrong, they're really useful, but they are not, repeat not, the whole answer. And if that's all you do, then it ain't going to work. Neither is getting a nice, friendly, supportive environment the whole answer. Neither is getting the best coach you can, the whole answer. And if you don't have all these three firing off each other, 
which is why it's very nice to hear organizations starting to slot people into you know specialist roles in terms of emotional well-being i would even like performance because i prefer that because that's what we're here for but well, you know it's fair cop that's what you try and do so what I'm going to do is, for the, the time that's left me, I'm going to take one. I'm going to take little snapshots from each three, and there's loads of stuff I could put in. But what I'm going to try and do is to choose an, examples from each of those three areas that exemplify this idea of principles. Here are the principles of what you got you're trying to do. Okay. So um, the first thing is the skills for forward progress. What can I get? That will make me as good as I can possibly can be. This, this empowers me. I do this. You don't do it to me. You might do it with me. But what can you teach me so that I am what I hope our goal would be in here, which is the autonomous, self-developing professional? That's what I do. I look after me. I can be good. Now, if I need something, that's no problems. I've also got the built-in capability to ask. Now, there's lots of this sort of stuff. There's a measure in the, in the literature called grit or perseverance. Um, again, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to dash through these because they're going to be available to you afterwards. But here's a very simple questionnaire. At the top, you go on a one to five, yeah, where you are on those, very much like me or not at all. The bottom uh, items are reversed, they're the other way around. This is to catch out prop forwards like me who just go three, 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 three or whatever because the scores don't add up. You might like to select a couple of few of those questions and see where you'd measure up. That's enough. Okay, so that's a simple questionnaire. It's simple, it's parsimonious, it's elegant. Yeah? One of my heroes, uh, uh, Richard Feynman, who's a triple laureate physicist, says if a theory isn't parsimonious, if a theory isn't simple enough to explain to a first year student, it's not a good theory. And if you've ever read physics textbooks, that's a pretty good position to guide to take. I much prefer the much less politically correct, in, uh, correct version from Ernest Rutherford in 1930, who said, if a theory isn't good enough to explain to a barmaid, it's not a good theory. But you take my point. You know, if you try and explain this, it should be simple. It should be clear. It should explain what's going on. Now, that simple measure, that simple eight-item eight questionnaire, predicts all sorts of odd things. And I mean odd because they're all so flipping different. Going through the course at the West Point Military Academy, winning the national group spelling bee, competitive outcomes in sport and music, and educational attainment, all independent of all the things that we think are much more important in predicting what's going on, like IQ, gender, ethnicity, parental income, etc., etc. My point, a simple set of skills, persistence, grit, stick at itness, whatever you like, is immensely powerful immensely powerful in, in, in getting the individual capable of developing her or his future. Take something else, developing self-control. Just turning around and trying to say that where people can recognize that they can control certain situations. Of course, there are certain people who are not in control of situations. That's an awful thing to be in. But most of the time, most of the situations we encounter are controllable. So, if X happens, then I'll do Y. I will plan what's going on. I'm on a diet. Actually, I'm not, but I certainly need to be. Yeah. Um, but let's say I was, and I go, right, when they offer me the sweet tray, I will go, I'll have a small lump of cheese, please. I've rehearsed it. I've practiced it. This is me getting into behavioral type intentions that develop my own personal self-control, as opposed to the much more global, I intend to lose 40 pounds by Christmas. Yeah, whereas, of course, I'll lose 500 pounds because my wife has my credit card. So, it, you know, it's easy to see. So, what you then start doing, and this is a feature that of, of, a, of a number of different schools, positive psychology, solution-focused therapy, there's lots of brand names out there. Think about what you want in the future, yeah, in conjunction with where you are, so where I am, where I want to be, and now automatically I'm breaking things down into stages. Pretty useful. You can measure this very early in delay of gratification. Uh, this was an absolute cracking study. Um, if I carry on talking, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay, so imagine you're five years old and you've just done really well at this. Well, I say you've done fantastic at this experiment. You can have one of these. But if you wait a week, you can have one of these. But in a month, we're getting a delivery of one of these. So it's up to you. You can have one of these today, one of these in a week, or one of these in a month. And when you're five, that's a pretty good test of your ability to go... I'll wait a month and have that one. 
Of course, if she beats me up and takes all three, I sign her up for the rugby team. But otherwise, yeah, she's a reasonable person. It's a very adult construct to think through and go, if I delay my gratification, I'll get that. That's what study is. That's what training is. That's what training to perform is. Yeah. So that's a pretty good thing to test. That's a pretty good sort of way to say, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that in my, my five-year-olds. And indeed, you can see it. So if you see these sorts of behaviours at age nine for US children, that's immensely predictive of how positive they are at age 15. So once again, same as before, some simple little measures, some simple little behaviours, getting into just good habits early. And all of a sudden, those things are very predictive because what's happened is that the individual performer, child, whatever, has internalised a set of skills which are going to be blooming useful for them when they get into challenge. Um, that simple measure predicts all sorts of things. So what we're actually talking about are our, 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 our behaviour sets skills, techniques, I call them psychobehavioural techniques because they're psychological but you can see them in behaviour, that you can get with young kids which will enable them and empower them to carry on growing. What we've done is to codify that. So what you've got there is a list of skills which to a greater or lesser extent, whatever performance domain you go into, are useful in making you good. So it doesn't particularly matter whether you want to be a good dancer, athlete, musician, surgeon, businessman, uh, academic, all sorts. That shopping list, the psychological characteristics of developing excellence, should be part of your implicit curriculum as you teach dance, rugby, I teach karate and judo, I teach it through that, it doesn't matter. You can teach it through loads of vectors, I'm involved in a program that teaches this through singing, yeah. But that's pretty much the core, what used to be called in old-style education, the hidden curriculum, the implicit curriculum in terms of developing the person. It's not the whole story, but by gosh, it's a big story. And I emphasise to you, ladies and gents, that these are pertinent to all performance environments. So if you are involved in a talent development environment where lots of people don't make it, I work for Chelsea Football Club, we will convert probably one in a thousand that we get on we look at at age six yeah so it's there's a pretty high wastage but if we're developing this all the way through then we are not pardon the words raping and pillaging the children we're actually giving them things that are useful to them as we try and develop on the way through i would passionately as an educationist put this into any performance environment because it's good when you're performing and it's good after you're performing as well okay so that's the first third that's the performer third Let's go into the second one. Let's look at what coaches can do. And obviously, there are lots of things that the coach can do that can facilitate those things here, yeah? One of the things, if you just realised it, don't worry, show it to someone later. Um, one of the things that coaches don't necessarily know about is the learning, the pedagogy of their, of their students, their pupils, call them what you will, yeah? They know lots and lots and lots about what they want to coach, dance, football, judo, doesn't matter, but they don't know anywhere near as much about the how it might be taught. So a simple example, broadly what do you want? Because there's a group of, there's a group of pedagogic skills for teaching physical skills that give you rapid improvement, rapid learning, walk in at the start, walk out at the end, tickety-boo, that's great, look how much they've progressed, that must be great. The bad news is that there is a different distinct set of, psych, uh, of coaching pedagogic skills which are good for program improvement, are good for retention, I can remember this, and transfer. In other words, you might be getting better learning from techniques that do not, at first sight and in your experience, appear to be good methods. What this says is, is, rec is basically whether you want to go for a long-term or a shorter-term hit in terms of benefit. Now, it doesn't mean... I've, I've said better learning, but that's a bit pejorative. If I go skiing, I want to be able to stay upright at the end of the week, not fall flat on my back, not break my leg, and be able to be fit enough to pull in the disco at the end of the week. That's my target, yeah? In which case, the set of very quick learning is perfect for me. It's absolutely great. If, however, I'm now signed up for an eight-year cycle into an Olympics, it's complete dross. And the problem is that 
very very few coaches are aware of this in of this overlap the the extent to which these things do not overlap they're relatively distinct you can have that or you can have that which would you like a practical example might make this clear um, this is the thing called distributed or blocked practice so if i block my practice uh, sorry if i distribute my practice i spread it out so for example um this is a real life situation in the old in the old days of the London County Council and GLC. I had five skills, one, two, three, four, five, and they all had a swimming lesson once a week. So you got Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. Every day, every every week for the whole term. And the teachers started going, this is crazy, because the kids, they're only seven or eight, they don't remember their kit. Are we swimming today, miss? Whatever. They don't know what's going on. The bus drivers get lost. Am I going to that school or that school? Whoop. Let's do it a different way. Let's have you guys do every day for two weeks. Then you guys every day for two weeks, then you guys, then you guys, then you guys. You still get 10 lessons, but it's blocked together, and you remember your kit, and the bus driver knows where he's going, and everybody's happy. And they did that because the amount of improvement that they saw in that block of two weeks was apparently much greater than the improvement they saw across the, the 10 weeks, one day a week. Make sense? Here's the crack. After two years, someone noticed, you know what, they're not very good the following year, are they? They seem to have forgotten it. What a bummer, yeah? Because we're trying to teach them to swim because we don't want them to drown, little darlings. So actually, even though the amount of learning seems to be lower when I spread it out, the quality of learning, the quality of retention, the quality of transfer is very different. Now, there are lots of different pedagogic methods like that, ladies and gentlemen. But the principle, if you want a principle indeed, is the harder you make it for the learner, the better the retention transfer, so long as you don't demotivate them. Okay? So if, for example, Erin, you're a, you seem like a, a bright lady, so, uh, a times tables test. Five sevens. Stop giggling. Come on. Five, five sevens. Five sevens. Five sevens. Five sevens. Five sevens. It's not too hard, is it? Yeah? Now, after the first two times, she thinks, git. After that, she's going, silly fat fool. What's he keeps asking me this question? Because what happens is she doesn't need to think about it. Her ability to give me the right answer very quickly improves and improves. She now feels very comfortable, but her ability to remember that or to use that Retain or transfer, that isn't very good. Ready again? Five sevens? Thirty-five. Four fives? Uh, Six sixes? Uh, Thirty-six? Uh, nine eights? Okay, while she works that out, <laughs> while she works that out, I make a mental note to fiddle my expenses claim form when I put it into her. But the main thing is here. Now, Erin feels a lot less comfortable, and that ensures I ain't going to get asked back here again, but she also has to work harder. Her brain has to work to process that stuff. That's the principle, yeah? It doesn't feel so comfortable, but it's much more better in terms of retention, good grammar. It's a, in terms of East End grammar, in terms of retention and transfer, in terms of her ability to remember that, and in terms of her ability to transfer it. And for, ye for weeks after this, having embarrassed herself in public, if someone goes five sevens, she sure as hell will remember the answer. Okay, so that's, that's my second principle. In summary, if you want rapid learning, if you want to do a come and try it day, yeah, for a bunch of young people or adults or whatever, and you want them to go from there to there, make it easier for the learner. Block practice, very clear instructions, simple demonstrations, lots of feedback. They make lots of progress. It's motivational, but they won't remember it two months later. If, however, you are working with a dancer for the long haul, this is someone you really think can make it. Make the learner work harder, spread out the practice, muck it about, question them a lot, show them demonstrations by people who are making mistakes and say, what's the difference? Give less feedback, make them think more. Slower progress, it can frustrate, but the last time I looked, so did performance, but they learn better, they code better. Simple pedagogic principle. How am I doing? Ten? One. One? Blow me. In which case, very quickly, how about the pathway to the top? And now I'm going to talk faster. All of these are my, uh, all of these are my clients. Um, the bugger was getting the horse to lie on the couch, but otherwise it's very, very, very good. Um, the route to the top is complex. It's uppy-downy. It's rocky road. That's a 50-cap Irish rugby international. 
I get that when I look at business people. I look, I've done dancers, I've done musicians, I've done a lot of different people getting to the top. And that is a very, that is a very positive but challenging route. This, and that is a, a young academy footballer who's just got chopped, is a very comfy but ineffective route because you reach the pinnacle which is the peak of the challenge and you've never been challenged before and you haven't got the skills to use and you haven't got the ability to confidence to be able to cope with it that is a, so if i see rapid improvement like that i get worried and i actually put some speed bumps and make it bumpy so the pathway smoothness often sees it going wrong because they just can't have the challenge the early rises actually re big crashes later on, so everything's positive, 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 ah, instead of upsy downy, and that's real life. So the slumps and crashes are essential. You need to do it. Give us another minute. Anyway, whatever. And that applies to all aspects of development. So it doesn't matter whether this is psychological, physiological, technical, tactical, whatever you like, that's the sort of pathway. So make your pathway lumpy is my my take-home principle message. Um, you won't go through this, and I certainly won't go through this, and I wasn't going to anyway, but here is a set of principles for what a long-term talent development, effective talent development looks like, environment looks like. So if you want to take that, have a look at the slide, and test out your environment against it, you can do that. We have a questionnaire that does it. More of that later. So pretty much in terms of light reading and references, that's what you might like to look at. Because however carefully you plan, the reality is that it becomes immensely bumpy, and it's good that it becomes bumpy. Thank you very much indeed for listening. <laughs> Over to you. So what a wonderful presentation from Dave Collins. Um, does anyone have any questions? We have time for maybe two. Fantastic presentation. I'm, I'm highly entertaining. I really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. However, I, I'm just sort of saying... However, oops. Well, no, I, I don't think it's an easy thing to answer, that's why. So it's more of a, a sort of sharing um, out loud rather than a formal question. I'm just wondering, as a, I understand the what you're delivering is uh, principles and um, I can see their relevance. I just wonder how, uh, in, in, a, in a dance perspective, they apply with issues such as um, things that I've touched on earlier, like sort of control, the element of control in dancers particularly, and also the sort of more subjective artistic um, <coughs> progressions which aren't necessarily able to qualify in those kind of terms? Answer in three parts. We've tried that out with the ballet company. We've tried it out with figure skating. It works fine. Uh, part two, what you're talk talking about here are humans. Yeah? And whilst there is a slight difference between a boxer and a ballet dancer, yeah, generally in the nose, there are, lots of, there are more similarities than there are difference. Yeah? Men are from Earth, women are from Earth, get on with it. So what you're actually saying is, here are some techniques. They're useful. They'll help you in a performance environment. Third factor, it's a performance environment. And whereas all the people you work with in a talent development in sense will not get to the top, you want them to get something from it, and that's why I do what I do. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, I wasn't necessarily asking you to justify what you do. I'm just oh, kind no, of no, thinking no. out I'm, loud. I'm more than happy. Yeah. I made a fool of myself in this place in this. You're right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, done. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So yeah. you said to challenge an individual without demotivating them. Where is the line, if say, between that lumpy road? You know. Great question. And that's my point. People want recipes. They want. So what do I do? So do I do two hours of that and three hours of that, one hour of that and four hours of that? What do I do? And the answer to any question in any of my presentations is it depends. Yeah. And my point is that knowing what it depends on is a lot of science and a touch of art. It's about feel. It's this shades of grey. That's why my company's called Grey Matters, yeah? Clearly ash blonde hairstyle and brain, but also because you don't get black and white answers. If I had black and white answers, I'd be doing them on the golf tour and making a fortune, yeah? There aren't black and white answers. And he or she that gives you black and white answers speaks with forked tongue. That's my point. There aren't any black and white answers. 
be scared stiff, be very, very wary of gurus. <coughs> Japanese proverb, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Which, as I get fatter and fatter, gets me more worried. But the point is, you meet someone who's got all the answers. No one's got all the answers except one person in the world, and I'm married to her. <laughs> Done. Thank you.